Um, I am not, by any stretch of the imagination, a web components expert. I'm more of a web components enthusiast. Uh, if you get the chance and are looking to dive into the, the innards of web components, then make sure you look for talks by googly people. Uh, this is a talk for web components outside of Google. Um, by the way, if you just got here, uh, there are slides at the bottom, bit.ly, jqcon web components. <clears throat> So this is a talk about web components for normal folk, people who have to weigh browser compatibilities and deadlines and a lot of other considerations before you can use new technology. So what are web components? Uh, we're gonna be going over some very, very quick basics because it's important to go over uh, to get a baseline so that when I'm talking about certain things, we all know what I'm talking about. Know that there are a lot of details and this is a very short talk and I'm not gonna be able to touch on all of them due to time. So, web components is the term for a collection of emerging technologies that allow you to better encapsulate individual pieces of web logic. Uh, just about anything can be a web component, data, API requests, UI, animations, whatever. Even if you're not overly giddy about web components as a whole, each of their constituent technologies is gonna be something that'll change the way you develop web applications. <clears throat> Even if you're not using them directly, they're gonna change the way frameworks are developed in the future, so you're gonna be using them one way or the other. First up is HTML templates. Uh, I'm sure each one of us has seen some uniquely horrific implementations of client-side templating. Uh, these two are some of the most common along with pre-compiled templates. Uh, functionally, they work and could be a lot worse. Uh, the biggest problem I have with them is that they just don't make sense. Why the hell are you putting a template in a script tag and why are you hiding massive chunks of DOM in order to clone them later? Uh, it's just one more piece of esoteric web crap that people have to learn and accept coming in and then move on. Now, sort of, uh, you have an actual HTML template element. Uh, it's important to note that the contents of these templates don't really exist in the way that you expect them to in the DOM until they're actually accessed and imported. Uh, so images aren't requested, scripts aren't executed, nothing's really done with them until you have actually started using them which means that these now are able to be more templatey than you ever have been before, uh, haven't been using them before. So you couldn't really use script tags in the other two implementations because if you use the script tag in the script block, it's gonna close the entire script block and it's gonna break your HTML. And in the second one, that's actually gonna be executed. Now you can have an initialization scripts in your templates so that when they are actually imported into your DOM, they run, things happen, and you're happy. So the benefits are that they, they are inert. Uh, you're no longer using inner HTML because you have native DOM methods in order to manage these templates. And if you're not dealing with inner HTML, you're not dealing with strings, which eliminates that security vulnerability avenue from your application. Uh, and they just make sense. Next up, we have custom elements. Uh, this may look a little less exciting if you're coming from an Angular world, uh, but think about this from a frameworkless perspective. Angular also encourages you to think about directives as what you do when you deal with the DOM, and most people read into that, directives are what you do when you need to do something UIE. Uh, custom elements can be anything. Uh, they can be defined to, uh, they can define relationships in your application. They can define a whole range of things that are more semantic for your application. Um, so just think, a world where your entire application is uh, specified by a slew of bracketed tags. And if you actually do imagine that, you probably get a little knot in your stomach because it actually does look a lot like XML. And by looking like XML, I mean you open it up and you have no idea what the hell it means. Uh, it's something that probably won't be an issue right away, but I could see HTML linters at some point popping up and limiting the number of custom elements people have because it is different to look at. And HTML structure is something that we have taken for granted over the course of the past 20 years. You look at some of the most traffic sites in the world, Google.com, for example, and some blog from Joe Schmo in Nebraska. If you view source on both of those, they're gonna look largely the same. You're gonna have the same HTML tags, the same head, body, div, spans, P's, whatever. Um, now, that's not gonna be, the, or in the near future, that's not gonna be the case, and it's gonna be weird. Uh, it's not gonna be quite as, as comforting as we once knew. The benefits are uh, we have legitimate real new elements. <clears throat> There's a lot of potential for you to define markup that is semantically appropriate for your actual application. 
Uh, we have articles and block quotes. We have mains, navs, p's, b's, m's, i's, whatever. Those are great for documents. Those don't necessarily make sense for applications. And a lot of us are making applications nowadays. And we can force those to work, but just like with templates, we shouldn't really need to be forcing the web platform to do what we're actually doing with the web platform nowadays. Next up is Shadow DOM. So Shadow DOM, there is a lot of magic occurring in Shadow DOM, and I'm covering it in about three slides. Uh, so this is just going to be a whirlwind tour of web components to get everyone understanding the basics, and they'll move on to how you can actually use them. Um, but this is basically creating an outer element div, normal, inner element p, normal, uh, attaching uh, inner text to hello jqcon. And with the outer element, we are creating a shadow root and appending the inner element to that, and then we're adding that to the body. So now, if people are familiar with DevTools, when you append something, you get what you appended back as a result. And if you see that bottom line there, it's the first hint at what's actually happening. What we appended looks like a blank div. So before I get into what this actually looks in the DevTools, uh, what you're getting is just this this magical sandboxed piece of DOM that you can do whatever you want with. Um, just imagine all the widgets you've ever created for any application for a third-party JavaScript or things you've released on GitHub, how much effort you've went through in order to prevent that widget from affecting the, the outside page or having the outside page affect your widget. Now you're not going to need to do that nearly as much. <clears throat> so. Uh, where this really hits home is when you start looking it, at it in a place uh, that you're probably very familiar with, and that's the Chrome DevTools. And this is going to be a very light demo. If you are interested in web components, then check out some of the more advanced ones on the web, because it, it really hammers at home much more. Um, but what you see here, this is the result of the code we just placed, and we just have an empty div in our body. To inspect the Shadow DOM, uh, if you open up the settings in Chrome DevTools, and for people who aren't familiar, just a question mark. I'm not actually sure where the button is. Um, but on the first page, you just check Show Shadow DOM. So this is what we had before. With the Shadow DOM, this is what we have now. Now this is starting to get into some serious magic, and for people who aren't that familiar with it, leave the Shadow DOM on. And you'll start seeing Shadow DOM in use a lot more than you probably would expect. You can inspect uh, video elements, you can inspect input range sliders, and you can see how the browser vendors have actually implemented these elements in the same way that you're probably going to implement your own custom elements in the future. And it's really cool to see that actually happening because now you're going to start having that capability. <clears throat> um, but if you can picture dev tools with dozens of custom elements lining the page, nested custom elements uh, with nested custom elements, this actual way of inspection gets a little bit cumbersome. Uh, this is still very early in the actual usage of custom elements, and I could expect that tools will probably change or to make this a little bit easier. Uh, but right now, it's a little bit cumbersome. So the benefits of Shadow DOM are uh, you actually get this really, really beautiful line of demarcation between your code and the page that, it's that is using it. And I, it's very, very rarely refer referenced, but you can use IDs again. And it, it sounds silly, but it's another one of those stupid things that we have to repeat over and over and over again. It's like, oh no, oh no, you don't use IDs because of X, Y, Z reason. And that X, Y, Z reason just gets just shot out over and over and over again. And I don't even know what all the reasons are nowadays. There's like a, a specificity. Somebody be like, oh, you don't understand specificity. And it's like, specific, shut up and you just can start using IDs the way you want, the way you always wanted, because we've always had these great ways of referencing elements, and we just haven't really been able to use them without these issues. So you can use the same IDs without worry inside your Shadow DOM, and if you're accessing it outside the Shadow DOM, and you just reference a Shadow root, and the same query selector you're probably used to. And third up, or fourth up, we have HTML imports. And these are basically just an include for the web. It, it sounds unexciting, and it might be unexciting if you don't like this sort of stuff. But think about where we've gotten without it. Think about if we had to include 
all JavaScript inline or all styles inline, or even we had to include images via data URIs. We've really benefited from the way of externally linking files to one source HTML, and now we can link chunks of HTML from a source. So if you think of something like Bootstrap, if you use Bootstrap, you probably get the JavaScript, you probably get the CSS, uh, maybe multiple CSS files, multiple JavaScript files, depending on what you're using. Now, if you wanted to, you could just import the entirety with one uh, HTML import. And as these, these technologies get better used, you can probably see how something like Bootstrap would use them. Uh, you could actually have real templates that you could override, which would change the way the custom elements work. Uh, you also wouldn't need to have to buy into the entire framework to use them. So the thing is that a lot of widgets, it's hard for you to really, really get much use out of them unless you buy into an entire package like jQuery UI, jQuery Mobile, Bootstrap, Foundation, all these things. They're great if you've bought into them, but if you want to use some widgets from some framework and some widgets from another, then you start realizing that this doesn't work that well. So our shadow DOM and all these things start becoming really beneficial because we have really great ways now of defining these custom elements and widgets. The benefits of HTML imports just that it gets stuff out of your stuff. And it sounds trivial, but now we have a standard way of doing this linking without any sort of JavaScript hackiness or build steps or server what have yous. Um, and you add imports to templates, shadow DOM, custom elements, and you've got a lot of magic going on. And that is right now web components. There are other aspects of web components that are changing that I'm not gonna deal with because I don't really know that much about them. So now you wanna know how you can use these stuff, uh, this stuff. So I have the support matrix for you and it looks pretty depressing. So to put this in perspective, some of this technology doesn't even have documentation up on MDN and I know the Mozilla Developer Network is a wiki, and I probably could affect that myself. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, but this is the point of Web Components Talks, where everyone gets to, and they see the support matrix, they see what they can use, and you start thinking to yourself, what? What, are, what is going on here? And bonus points for the reference, though you don't have any expectation of getting it, because you shouldn't need to get it. Uh, if you use Civilization V, maybe, it, you could get there a little bit faster, but no need. Um, so you see the support matrix, support matrix, you say what, you start wondering, why the hell am I here? There's a great talk next door you could easily bolt to. We've only been here for 13 minutes. Um, but I do have good news. Um, I have news. Uh, I, I have facts. I have good news. I have facts. Um, web components are usable. Uh, you don't need to be Google, but you do have to make excuses for them. You do have to be a little bit bold in the way that you actually write your applications. Uh, but why be bold? Uh, our jobs are pretty hard right now. The web is a pretty inhospitable development environment. So why go through the headache of using tech that is changing, tech that will change without notice and will be a support nightmare for years to come? So for people who did follow along at that last sentence, it sounds a lot like what our normal development cycle actually is already. Uh, we have browsers that change regularly. Uh, we have bugs that pop up when we had no expectation they would arise whatsoever. We have clients doing weird stuff. We have browsers doing weird stuff. And we have bugs that are found out from browsers that were released two, three years ago. Uh, it's just a different technology that now is, if we use web components, we're gonna be investing in our future instead of constantly following up on our past. And you're, you're at a tech conference. You probably flew from some place that was kinda chilly, maybe even had snow. It's a beautiful day outside and you're choosing to be in here listening to someone you don't know, talk about a technology you probably haven't used before. You're already a little weird you already have the potential to be that person who can actually make magic happen on the web. Uh, there's a serious shift that is happening in the web right now and that's putting a lot of power in your hands. It's web components, uh, graphics, audio, data channel, uh, ASM.js, uh, WebRTC, all these things, they're changing how we actually use the web. Web components can be practical for apps now, but a lot of the benefit you get from using them 
is you investing in your future, is you in building and supporting the future that you want to have. And the web learns best from itself. There's precedent for this. Uh, Document.get elements by selector being the basis for query selector and selection engines, though with jQuery people here, I would like that to be verified because that's as far as I know it. I think it was about 2003, the first reference I got for that. Uh, but CoffeeScript, a lot of CoffeeScript uh, lent its hand to uh, advances in the ECMAScript 6. Uh, CSS has always evolved based around what the community has needed. The web learns from you, literally you, the people in this audience, the dude in purple right here, right in the front. It, it, everyone, everything that you're doing, if you're open about it, if you blog about it, if you talk about it, the cool stuff that you do can change the future. Look at John fucking Resig. Look at where we are right now. Like this is not out of reach for anyone here. We just have to be the people that takes things to the next level. Uh, but moving on, the stuff we get from committees and spec writers is excellent, but they focus on making stuff actually possible. We as a community take those and cut out all the edge case stuff and make the com common use cases actually satisfying to use. I don't think I need to justify why we do that, how we do that, or the value in doing that. Um, so we can move on pretty quickly, right? So how do you use web components? So since the spec is changing, and the spec is changing regularly, I had to change the content of this talk because the spec had changed. Um, so a library for creating these web components is probably where you'd start even if you don't look for the community. So you want some central place where these spec changes are dealt with so that you can use some common interface in order to create, create them. Uh, there are a few solutions out there, but the one I'm gonna talk about is Polymer. So if jQuery is the satisfying way of dealing with cross-platform DOM, Polymer is the satisfying way to deal with cross-platform web components. One of the stated goals of Polymer is to make the bleeding edge functionality usable by the community so that we can test things before they are actually standardized upon. And this is also part of the shift of the web, is that rather than try to make expectations with how the web is going to be used, expose as much as possible so the community can decide how the web is going to be used. So Polymer is separated into two pieces. Uh, the platform, which consists of polyfills for the technologies that we just talked about and more. And Polymer proper is a framework that makes the marriage of all these technologies easy to use. So this is, at its core, the simplest way to specify a custom web component with Polymer. Uh, we have a name, we register this through Polymer via JavaScript, and you'll notice that this is all in HTML, which is gonna make sense once we start tying a lot of these HTML pieces together. Now we compare that with the native implementation and this is what it looks like. Not a huge amount of savings line-wise, uh, but you notice this is all JavaScript. We create a prototype based off of the HTML element prototype, and then we register a new, uh, new, new element called hello-world with the HTML element prototype. That's not too exciting. This is what Polymer looks like when we start to fill in the useful pieces of web components. So here, all we did was add a template on lines two to four, and this provides the inner content of what our element is gonna have. <clears throat> so now let's take a look at the native, and just at the start, we can already see a significant savings in just what it looks like. So this is largely the same implementation of the previous. We have the same template at the top, the exact same one that we used, in, used before. Uh, we have the same register element, register element that we had in the original native implementation, and now we've added a lifecycle callback so that when the element is created, we can get the template, we can import it into the document, and then we create a shadow root on the element that was just created and append the template's contents to it. So it's still, it is relatively straightforward, but if we started doing that ourselves, we'd eventually be writing something probably similar to Polymer or X tags or anything along those lines because it, it gets a little cumbersome. So yay, Polymer. Uh, with all of its polyfills, utility, and everything, it's great. Uh, this is uncharted territory. We have somebody who's gonna be holding our hands and making us feel secure and excited. And by the way, that person who is gonna be holding your hand uh, is most often Eric Beidelman. Um, so if you do are interested in any of this stuff, uh, take a look at his videos on YouTube, googly places, 
Uh, he's a delightful person. I've never met him. Um, but if I did, I'd probably show affection like a dog and be all excited, which apparently is, I guess, licking him. I would lick him if I met him. Um, unfortunately, as we're dealing with bleeding edge technology and in a framework in active development, uh, we are going to run into a lot of issues. The website for Polymer is polymer-project.org, and they are very open in saying that this is probably not stuff that you should rely on for serious code. Uh, Polymer is semantically versioned, though I have seen web components stop working from 010 to 014. I forget why it happened, but it did happen. So even if you are concerned about updates and you're dealing with semantic versioning, things can still break. So Polymer, boo. This is not a comment on the framework or the developers, it's just the fact of the environment right now. So we can't rely on one thing too much. So. What is the reality? Uh, we know flat out that browsers don't support this technology, but we have polyfills, so how do they actually stack up? This is an example with two sets of identical DOM running in Chrome, 30, uh, Chrome Canary, which at the time of the screenshot was 34 point blah, 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 blah. And the top exists in the host page, um, attracting all the bludgeoning of its nearby styles. And the bottom lies in the protective cuddling of Shadow DOM and all related web component goodness. <clears throat> This is what it should look like. The top one is crap, the bottom one is clean and nice. This is what it looks like in IE 10. Uh, I know it's a bit tired and cliche, but I don't think we ever expect much from IE at this point. Um, so we can move on pretty quickly. It's so what it looks like in Safari. And Safari is usually a pretty accommodating browser. Either it falls in line with stuff that we want to support anyway, or its problems are similar to stuff that we're forced to support. This is what it looks like, similar to IE. Uh, Firefox, though, they're the kings of support, leapfrogging Chrome in awesomeness. Uh, but we don't get that much there either. This doesn't bode well for usefulness, because if we can't rely on Firefox, then we can't reasonably be expected to only develop things for Chrome users, which is OK, because we don't get much there either. Um, this is Chrome 32. And these are all with default flags on, so the way you could actually expect a real person to visit a site. And I'm sorry for this push and pull telling you about web components and telling you they're not supported, telling you there are polyfills, telling you the polyfills don't work. Um, that's not true. The polyfills do work, uh, but we're here to talk about the reality. I'm not trying to tell you things exist when they don't. Um, but it is actually largely there. What you probably completely glossed over is that the component did register and was rendered. You did get the lifecycle methods. Uh, I didn't show them to you because they're boring to look at. And uh, Polymer itself does give you a lot of fancy data binding. And there's a lot of other stuff it does give you. So it actually is all there. It's just that Shadow DOM is not very polyfillable, which is a shame because it's arguably the sexiest part of web components. But there is still value in web components, even without Shadow DOM. So when you hear Shadow DOM is polyfilled, there are polyfills that make some things work. But it, it just doesn't seem that necessary, because a lot of what you want doesn't work. So I guess the polyfill is mostly to say that if you use something like create shadow root, you're not going to cause an error in JavaScript. But if you have AngularJS, why would you use web components in the first place? Uh, do we have a lot of AngularJS people here? Do we have a lot of people who came in thinking this was going to be a talk about AngularJS and making widgets with directives? Because people who don't know what web components are, it's like it sounds like a generic term for cool widgety stuff. Um, but no, that's not true. Um, but they are truly separate, and they do complement each other well, and you can use them together. One does not replace the other. One's not an alternative for the other. Uh, web components make better application agnostic widgets, uh, even without Shadow DOM. Uh, directives and web components can live together peacefully and benefit from each other. And a lot of the benefit I find with web components is that it removes code from your application. It moves where it is, but it's a very, very severe and hard line of demarcation where your application just doesn't know anything about web components. It just uses them. You're not depending on a module. You're not incorporating it into your application. They just exist. So uh, I'll show you a quick demo on how to use AngularJS and Polymer. You won't be explicitly binding to Angular data from within web components. What you do is you bind to an element attribute, like you would normal Angular directives, and then you listen for changes on that attribute, and you do what you need to in web components. So this is, doo -doo -doo. This is what it would look like. Um, you have uh, Polymer's platform, Angular, 
Uh, I'm importing the web custom component blinky rainbow.html. And here is an Angular controller. Here is a model. And here we are binding that uh, contents of the text bo uh, input box to uh, blinky rainbow's value. Does anyone have any idea what an element called blinky rainbow would do? Doesn't that look awesome? I miss that so much. This is like a superior blink. Um, this is what it looks like in the, the inspector. So this is what I, I mentioned when I, things, things, uh, when I say things look cleaner in uh, web components. Like with Angular, you have ng-scope, ng-valid, ng-dirty, ng-scope, blah, 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 blah. This is what a web component looks like. I'm not showing you Shadow DOM because we're going to move on pretty quickly. But it just looks clean. It looks like it exists, and it looks like you use it, and then you move on. So web components are useful. They are important. We're not talking about web audio, something that is only going to be useful to a subset of specialized apps. Web components expose low-level UI functionality to developers in order to define the web going forward. Your feedback is necessary, and your expertise is valuable. So be vocal about your use of these things. But the bleeding edge is accessible, including Shadow DOM. You just have to make excuses for it. Uh, one example is prototypes. So web components will aid your development cycle. Uh, they bring a lot to the table, and their benefit should be pretty obvious. Uh, there is actual benefit in only developing prototypes with the bleeding edge. Because at that point, when you have a completed product or a completed prototype, you can attach cost to backwards compatibility. If you make a prototype with all the technology that you actually want to use, and it takes an extra two months for IE7 compatibility or whatever, then it's easy to say, hey, that costs this much. If you're programming with IE7 in mind all the time, then it looks like it's free. When it's not, we all know it's not. It sucks. So let's cut it out first and then add it later. Another example is internal tools. How many of your internal tools get developed and then ignored because they do their job forever? This is a perfect opportunity to experiment with a lot of different technology, web components, even frameworks that you haven't used before. Even if maintenance is a concern and you want to come back to something, and that's why you want to use something like Backbone or Angular, if you develop something and don't come back to it for 6 to 12 months, it's going to suck no matter what you use. Even with the versioning, even with all the dependence, if you try to come back to something and bring it up to date, it's going to suck. So use something that actually pushes you forward. And we all think web apps are cool, uh, but web apps aren't cool. You know what's cool? Native apps. This is something that we never really think about because we're born and bred to put stuff on the internet. And it's cool. That's a great place. But there is a lot of benefit for native apps. And you've got to think about what you're trying to solve. Do you really need a web server? Or do you just love working with web technology? It's easy to do everything as a website. And you just throw it up and it works. But there's a whole load of extra benefit that comes from having a, a native app. Uh, you get a better OS shortcuts, better window management, a feeling of reliability. I could open up a tab and load docs.google.com in my browser. I'm not sure if that's going to work. If I need to do something useful on a plane, I'm going to be kind of concerned about how well that's going to work over the course of the flight. What if it gets connection for a few seconds? Is it going to reload the page? I'm going to lose what I'm doing. When you double click an icon on your desktop, it's a different understanding of how things are supposed to work. And as a developer, you also have those expectations as well. And there are a lot of things you can do nowadays that make it really easy to do this. Node WebKit is a beautiful example. Uh, Brackets Shell is very similar to Node WebKit in wildly different ways. Um, CEF, if you have any sort of native experience, you can embed Chromium pretty easily into your applications and Chrome packaged apps. So to give you an example of what one of those might look like, do, do, do. So here's a sweet, sexy particles.app. Double clicked it, and it's on my screen. Do, 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 do. But notice frameless, draggable, sexy particles. And it's, it's all just, it's cute. It's nice. I press Control or Command Q to get rid of it, and it's gone. Do you want to see what the code looks like? So this is what we have here. So we include the platform. We include 3.js. Uh, this is just a Node WebKit boot script that expands it appropriately. Styles, we import the particle system element. We uh, specify that we want to take up the entire screen. And here's where we, we show it. 
and that, it looks cute, right? I mean, it is a little bit contrived for the sake of the talk um, because you don't really need just a spinning ball of particles all the time. And I could do this with one line any other way. I just include a script tag. But when you see this, you have an understanding of what that contract is. I know that if I use that, I can probably change the number of particles by changing the particles attribute of that element. If I include a script tag, I have no idea what, how deep the control of that script goes, whether or not it takes control of the entire window, whether it expands everything. If I have an element, I can be pretty sure that it expands to fill the width of that element, and I can control pieces of it with attributes. Um, so I believe, ooh, I am 18 seconds over, so this talk is done.